Thank you very much, Anders. And I'm very happy to be here and give this lecture. Uh, the, there's actually one main point in this lecture that uh, decision theory, as is, as is practiced today, and as it dominates many of the fields, perhaps it dominates a little less systems, but it definitely dominates uh, the social and behavioral sciences. So this decision theory has recently be, been challenged by a lot of empirical evidence that shows that uh, rules of thumb, which are really very simple, they are simple so that people like you and me and even animals use them every day. These kinds of very simple rules of thumb can actually outperform the standard uh, decision theory. So this will be the main point uh, in the second part of my talk. In the first part of my talk, what I will do quickly by way of example, I'll make sure we understand each other about what the standard decision theory is and what these simple rules of thumb are. Uh, but before that, I, I definitely want to avoid disappointing anybody, even though this is a lecture on systems. All the examples I'm going to present are from decisions that are not exactly as grandiose as uh, designing a computer network or deciding where to drill for oil uh, or how to build a suspension bridge and so on. But you will see, I just wanted to say this so that there's no disappointments. Nevertheless, I think the, the decisions are very very interesting and very relevant. So perhaps we can have a discussion how our research could scale up and uh, be of use in systems. This has, not, this has not been done so far. So as I said in the first part of the talk, I will uh, provide definitions of the standard decision theory and of rules of thumb. So to do this, I will introduce just a specific decision context. So let's say that you are the owner of a small studio apartment and you want to rent it. So today is the 9th of October and from your experience, you know that people don't move around that much when it gets cold. So you pretty much have only a few weeks more to decide on a tenant. And let's also say that so far you have screened it down to two people, to two options actually that are interesting to you. So <coughs> this is the first option. It's a, it's a pair of scientists. They just came back from abroad, and they're working in a government think tank, and they're very interested in the place. If they could, they would, uh, they would move in tomorrow. Their combined income is enough. They can afford to rent your apartment, and they're simply waiting for your response now. The competing option is him. So he's a, a tax consultant working for a big multinational company. He also, have he also has enough income to rent your apartment. Uh, and he also likes it very much. And he's also just waiting for your decision. So perhaps we could take a couple of minutes, if somebody's daring enough, to, to suggest what, what they would actually do. So how would you make that decision? How would you start, even? Anybody wants to try? So liking means exactly in the way we all mean it, right? Liking as a person. Yeah. OK, all right. That's fair enough. Yeah? <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. OK, that's a smart idea. OK. <laughs> So, <laughs> you, you kind of already stole my fire because none of the ideas that were proposed is really what would fit in the straight jacket of standard decision theory. But <laughs> anyway, let, let me say what, what, what that is. It, it's a, yeah? <laughs> um, let me present a caricature for that, mostly for the purposes of my talk and in order to, to present the concepts I want to present. I know there are many nuances of, of this theory, but I'll present a caricature. I think the core ideas are, are intact. So the main point is the following. You have to structure your decision problem. And standard decision theory is, in a sense, not so flexible about how this structure should look. It has to look, the options eventually have to look exactly like this. So what's, what's the crux here? So each option has to have uh, a number of outcomes. These outcomes must be numerical. 
and they must be obtained with quantitative probabilities. And you have to know all these numbers. You simply have to know them, otherwise you cannot proceed. So here the outcomes would be, for example, 10,000 pounds and 5,000 pounds. And you see the respective probabilities. Um, now, in the real world, usually, even in this example, that's relatively simple. It's definitely not a large systems design example. You have to do a lot of work to bring it into that form. So for example, here you have to start reasoning as follows. This 10,000 pounds, for example, could be the maximum rent, the rent you would actually receive if you, if you had it rented for the whole year. So assuming that they do pay the rent, <laughs> and assuming that they don't move out earlier than the whole year because they found something else, that's how much you're going to get. So that's the best case scenario. Then, of course, you realize that it could be that they're not paying and you have to kick them out and you have to find somebody else, or that they really move out a little earlier. So then you have to think, what value do I uh, assign to this outcome? And the next thought you can make is that, okay, on the average, it would be something between zero and 10,000 pounds. So let's say it's 5,000 pounds if all these events are equiprobable. And then the other thing you need to do is you f need to find some estimates of these probabilities. So, and this is often the hardest part. So let's say that somehow you estimate the probability that uh, they will move out or that you will have to kick them out before the end of the year to be 20%. You may reason if you're a frequentist that from your past experience, one out of five people do not meet their obligations as tenants, so you have to pick, kick them out. So you have to do something like that. It's definitely not trivial. But of course, that's not to say that it can never be done. But it's definitely not easy. Um, and you also need an alternative option. And for example, let's say that you assume that the tax consultant is more, of a, he's more predictable, let's say, but still he may try to negotiate the rent. So let's say, okay, you estimate that you, you will get 9,000 pounds out of him, not the 10,000 pounds. So if you manage to bring it into this structure, standard decision theory says you still need to do something else. Your job is not done. And I'll illustrate it graphically. It's the prospect theory of Kahneman and Tversky, which earned them Nobel Prize. So the idea is you need to estimate some functions for each decision maker and transform the numerical parameters that I showed you before into their subjective value to the, um, um, to the decision maker. So this is the function that transforms the numerical outcomes to the value. So for example, what you would need to do, you would need to go and, and, and read off how 10,000 pounds is really worth to somebody, and so on. And this, this function is, of course, uh, is supposed to be different for every person. So you have to estimate it first. And how that's done, it's done through a series of elicitation methods. It's a big deal how it's done. It's not trivial. People do try to do it, and they have methods for doing it. But it's extra work estimating this, this function. It tends to look like this, and then applying it to get the first uh, input to prospect theory. The second input is very similar, actually. It's, a, it's another function that transforms the probabilities here on the um, x-axis to weighted probability. So here you would read off what a 20% probability really means to you. Typically, one of the claims of prospect theory, if you have heard it, is that small probabilities, for example, this 20%, are actually kind of overweighted. They're above the diagonal. And larger probabilities are underweighted. But anyway, here's the same kind of work. You have to estimate these parameters, and you have to eventually uh, uh, find what the probability really means to the person. After you have done that, you have to multiply outcomes with the probabilities, and then you get a value for each option. So in maths, it would be exactly like that. This is a notation we use. This is simply the first option, the scientist. So 10,000 pounds with 80% probability, 5,000 pounds with 20% probability, and this is the certain 9,000 pounds. So deciding for this two, so excuse me, deciding for the first one is when the subjective value of this option, this overall utility, is larger than the overall utility of the other option. We don't need to get too much into that. I just wanted to show you that there's also an extra algebraic test uh, step you need to take after you've estimated. So <coughs> that, that's really the caricature. And no matter how complicated the problem gets, eventually you have to do something like this. This is the core of standard decision theory. So abstracting a little bit of that, I'm attempting something like a definition of standard decision theory in a very broad conceptual term. So the first thing I would like to claim is that it is complex. 
and it is complex. So for complex problems, it offers complex solutions. In which way do I mean this? First, as I said, it attempts to, to compute a measure of worth for each option. You do that first, and then you do everything else. And then you decide the option with a higher uh, measure of worth. The, the complexity comes into how you make this uh, computation of the measure of worth. It always involves making trade-offs between good and bad features. In this case, the good feature is that somebody pays, and the bad feature is the probability that they may not pay. And uh, I think that's the most important, for the purpose of this talk, this is the most important conceptual criticism of the standard decision theory, that making the trade-off requires estimation. So as you saw before, you first have to estimate the numerical outcomes. 10,000 pounds and so on. Then you have to estimate the probabilities you obtain them, 80% and so on. Then you have to actually transform those. You have to transform them to utilities and to subjective pro and to weighted probabilities, as they're called in prospect theory. This is actually a lot, is a big burden on the decision maker. That's the truth. Of course, it cannot be done. It's done all the time, but it's not clear if the estimates you get are in some sense reliable or close to the true numbers that the decision maker uh, has inside them. So that's the sense in which I think that deci standard decision theory is uh, complex. So let me um, divert a little bit and tell you how we got to that, uh, to be a little less dry. So I wonder if anybody knows who these three gentlemen are. So, so on the so on the left, you see uh, von Neumann Morgenstern, and on the right, you see Jimmy Savage. So my point is that they started it. They founded utility theory. They were, they were not exactly mathematicians, not all of them, and certainly von Neumann was many things. Uh, but this was mathematical work, and what it did, it showed how a system of behavioral axioms, like transitivity, if I prefer option A to option B and option B to option C, then I must prefer option A to option C. They showed how a system of such axioms is equivalent to the decision rule I showed you before with this aggregation of probabilities and uh, utilities. Uh, von Neumann and Morgenstern did that for objective probabilities, if you knew them, and Savage did that jointly for subjective probabilities. Uh, a point I want to make is that if you read Savage, at least, which I've read a little more, you don't get the feeling that he meant that really as a guide for what to do in real life. In fact, he specifically said this only applies to what he calls small worlds. So this is when you can really estimate all the things that you need. But he didn't say that this estimation is trivial or that could always be done. This was done in the 40s and the 50s. And in the late 50s and the early 60s, some, some, somehow something changed. And I think that it now dominates the way most academics think about decision theory, and then they try to bring it into practice. And it was these two people who changed it, actually. And um, it's Howard Rifa and it's Ward Edwards. So <coughs> mostly I want to talk about Ward Edwards because he's very fitting to this lecture. For most of his career, he was a professor of systems engineering at the University of Southern California. Uh, he basically he lived for a long time, <laughs> and he was very, very active. And he really believed that the way to make these decisions correctly and properly was to do what none of you said earlier and was encapsulated in these uh, equations I showed you before. So uh, at some point in 84, he famously declared that no principle other than maximizing subjective expected utility deserves a moment of consideration. So he was really a fanatic. He was around for a very long time. He was very active. He collaborated with mathematicians that uh, uh, developed the, the techniques. He, he collaborated with psychologists that did the experiments to see how the elicitation works out and how it doesn't, and so on. So he had a very broad view of decision theory. He was, in a sense, you could say, the last person before decision theory got so big, at least in the social and behavioral sciences, that he had a tremendous impact. So if you open most of the textbooks in industrial engineering departments and operations research departments, you, you could really see his influence coming through. And basically, the point I want to submit is that most academics today really think that no principle other than maximizing subjective effective utility deserves consideration. And 
here we, we come again to the alternative that was being, that, that is being built up uh, slowly, I think, uh, and just gathered some momentum in the last 15 or 20 years through empirical evidence that these rules of thumb can really, under some conditions, out, outperform the standard decision theory. So the, the heroes of these rules of thumb, there are people like you and I, and they're actually even more interestingly uh, animals like the Norway rat. So the Norway rat is, is really a, um, a radical because he, make, he does away with the first basic tenet of standard decision theory. Not only he doesn't assign a worth to each option, but he refuses to consider some options. So what he does not consider when he has to choose between two food options is these food options that he has never, uh, re that he has never experienced before. So the options he doesn't recognize. Experience in his case, it means that he uh, smells the breath of conspecifics to see if they have eaten something uh, that he, w of which the smell he doesn't recognize. And if that's the case, he does not consider uh, this food at all. So not everybody is so radical, but the honeybee, even though it, uh, it considers uh, different options in a way it assigns, uh, a measure of worth to each option does that in a very simple way, not by weighting and adding as is suggested by uh, multi-attribute utility theory. When it has to identify a species of a flower, it simply goes through its features one by one without integrating them in the order of uh, odor, color, and then shape. And finally, um, this, this, this kind of ant um, is even more creative, is very creative as we would all be, and tries to put new attributes into the table for making a decision beyond those that could possibly be served to them. So in order to estimate the, the, the size of a candidate nest cavity, it goes first around the cavity in a, let's say, semi-random, pseudo-random path, then goes away for a little bit, and then comes back. The first time it does that, it leaves a firm on trail. And, the, and when it comes back, it checks, does that again, goes around the nest cavity again, and checks the frequency of uh, meeting the previous pheromone trail. And uses that as a proxy to see how big the cavity nest is. So it creates its own feature. <coughs> Incidentally, if you want to see more, those are all collected in a paper by John Hutchinson, who actually used to work here in Bristol Biological Sciences for, for many years, I think. So anyway, what's the point? If we get back to the um, apartment renting example, uh, you had already actually, most of you produced the uh, rules of thumb, so I'm not going to ask you again to do this. But I'm going to try to draw a strict analogy between um, the, some rules of thumb that are very reasonable, they were not mentioned by you, but exactly so how these rules of thumb would, from a formal point of view, be different from the standard decision theory, how in a way they do everything that the standard decision theory doesn't do. So this is a very reasonable rule. They the both look OK. You don't care. You just want to take a chance with somebody. You simply do something um, analogous to, rec to, to using this recognition rule that the Norway rat uses. I mean, you probably don't recognize any one of those, so that wouldn't help. But you take the one that, in a sense, you're more familiar for the most time. So you take this tenant who contacted you first. I mean, you can also see that as a variation of what's sometimes called the seniority rule, right? We always prefer, not always, but sometimes we prefer things that are older. Uh, so here, you do not consider at all the tenants uh, who contacted you late in the process. Another rule is um, doing some kind of evaluation for all the tenants, but uh, using only one feature, and here the feature would be the income. And finally, the analog to what the leptothorax albipen is, this last rod that you saw, the creative, the last ant, the creative ant does, would be to try to find out some more, actually, than what they tell you. So you try to find out if they smoke or not. That could be very important for you. If that allows you to make a decision, you make it. And if it doesn't, then you look for more information. But you do it more in an even less structured way that goes completely away 
from uh, how standard decision theory would do it. So <coughs> I put all those in here to, uh, to, um, to show you a little bit how I think about the rules of thumb. And here is a more, let's say, an attempt of a definition again in, in broad stroke. So unlike standard decision theory that offers complex solutions for complex problems, here the idea is to offer simple solutions for complex problems. In what way do we mean simplicity? It's most of the time a negative definition, it's a negation of what the standard decision theory did. So remember uh, the Norway rat, you do not always consider all options. Sometimes you brush aside some options uh, without calculating the worth at all. In fact, you never compare the worth of options in a certain way, only which option has a higher worth. Uh, any computations you do do not involve trade-offs. So you didn't trade off whether somebody was a smoker or not with how much money they could pay. You just decide based on only one feature. Sometimes you may decide based on very few features. Something that I think is very important for making this thing simple, and I think it's the single most important difference, is exactly this word here. I mean, the feature, there are very few, only one or very few, but they're also very observable. You do not have to estimate something. Remember, in standard decision theory, you had to estimate the numbers and even transform them. Here, they're exactly, you, you can observe them directly, just like um, the honeybee can do this. It just looks or senses. That's how you can also do it by simply figuring out, by simply asking them if they smoke or if they have a high income and so on. So it's observable. It's very different from estimating the features that enter your decision. And finally, that's where the psychology comes in, is that these features usually call from, come from what psychologists call core capacities. That's a term mostly from cognitive psychology. So our capacity for recognition is one, is, is tremendous, is really still better than any artificial system we can design. There's no artificial system that can recognize faces or visual patterns as well as children or sometimes even infants can. So uh, these are the ways in which the rules of thumb are simple. They may deep down not be that simple in the sense that the process of recognizing something could involve a lot of computation, but in the end at the phenomenological level they do appear very simple. So quickly let me provide you the uh, equivalent uh, history. So the man of rules of thumb, just like standard decision theory. So the man on the left is one of the heroes of our institute, Herbert Simon, who also got the Nobel Prize in economics. Concurrently with von Neimer and Morgenstern and Savage, he started actually arguing that this is never going to work. The variants of utility theory are never going to work. And he was going towards the direction of something simpler, which he coined with a very big term of boundary rationality. Um, the man on the right is, is our boss, is Gerd Gigerenzer. And he, there is a sense in which we didn't say anything new, but he, he managed to flesh it out mostly through systematic study. And this systematic study was probably more convincing because the rules of thumb that you saw that, 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 that were compared with standard decision models, they were not verbal, but they were mathematical models. So you could use computer simulations to really measure their performance rigorously against uh, standard decision models. And then you could really provide rigorous proof whether really these rules of thumb are worth something or not. You, you didn't need only to hand, hand wave and say, but look, this is simpler, you can always do it, and it's not going to be that bad. You can see that in this case it's going to be okay. So we, we ended up being in the position of having some uh, precise results that delineate, help delineate at least the conditions under which one is more, is, performs better than the other, one being standard decision models and the other one being rules of thumb. And now we go to the second part of my talk where exactly I'll present to you selectively some of this evidence so you see a little bit how it looks and also provide you some references if you want to find out a little more about it. So, <clears throat> so the first example is a sport that's it's very popular in this country. 
So let's say that what you wanted to do is wanted to predict the outcomes of the upcoming Wimbledon tennis tournament. So here you can exactly formulate the analog to what the Norway rat does, the so-called recognition heuristic. It would really look like this. You would say, suppose two people are playing. If you recognize one player, not the other. So if you heard the name of one player, but not the other, go with the one that you know the name of. Um, it's fine. The problem that it has is that it cannot be used that often. If you think about it, you can only use it at most 50% of the time. Maybe you recognize most of the people, or maybe you do not recognize most of the people. The best you can do is use it only 50% of the time. If you <laughs> use this kind of wisdom of crowd thing, you can actually use the recognition heuristic almost all the time. So it's a, it's, it's a variant of it. So you somehow ask your friends, or you try to get a proxy for whom of the two players most other people recognize. So if you had 10 friends and eight recognized player A and six player B, you would predict player A will win. So, and now the question is, even though this is written verbally, you can probably see that it could be simulated exactly on a computer and you get exactly uh, a percentage of how many of the Wimbledon tennis uh, games you uh, you predicted in one instance, and that's what and that's what uh, these two researchers did for the Wimbledon 2005. So they gathered the recognition data from real people uh, a few months or weeks before the tournament commenced, and then with that date with, with with this input, they let the model run uh, while the while the tournament was taking place. There was 127 games. In matches in this in this tournament, and um, these are the results. So, <coughs> if you are uh, tracking everybody's performance, all the 127 contestants for the last year, and you somehow weighed their victories, so you know if you if you if you beat somebody that's very highly regarded, or if you beat a trophy, or, or if you win a trophy, that counts for more. Uh, and you contact a rank of the 127 players, and you use that rank to decide, then that's, that's what you would have gotten. Uh, these are the official seedings from the tournament. When the players go into the tournament, everybody has a seed, so that they avoid that high, highly seeded um, players play each other in the beginning. So in the crowd version of the recognition heuristic that you saw, was exactly this one. So this is a, it's, it's in a way not a very exciting result because it's kind of flat, but in a way it already gives you an indication that there is a reason to investigate these very simple rules of thumb further. Uh, and that's what I'm going to present in the next example because I could also imagine that you have another uh, protest here that where are the standard decision models? They're actually here and here in the sense that both of these algorithms do exactly what standard decision theory does. They take all the future features and they estimate weights and they, they let them compensate for each other. Uh, so for the next example, so it has to do with health. So this man is just having a possible uh, ischemia episode. So he's feeling a very intense chest pain. So this is with the words of two practicing doctors in, in Michigan. So the decision here is um, somebody complains of a very high chest pain, should you uh, put them to the regular nursing bed or to the emergency unit? <laughs> this is the standard decision theoretic model, one of the standard decision theoretic models of doing it today. So it was developed and calibrated at MIT. It's based on a logistic regression. You take the relevant features. Here, basically, you see uh, this is one feature, whether the chest pain is a, the chief complaint or not. This is reading from the electrocardiogram, the ST segment, and a couple of other things. And for each combination of uh, feature values that you get, you get an estimate of the probability that this is uh, serious, that the person is going to get a heart attack. And then you also need a threshold. If this probability is higher than this threshold, you commit them to an emergency room. Otherwise, you don't. So this really has all the ingredients of standard decision theory, as I was telling you before. 
to get these numbers, you need to estimate the weights of the logistic regression. And uh, you end up having an estimate probability, and then you also have another parameter, this threshold, to make your decision. Um, and the alternative is what has come to be called the fast and frugal tree. So it's a simple decision tree that uses very little information, so it's frugal, and hence it also can be fast. And it looks like that. So um, there's two main differences from the logistic regression. One is that you go through the features sequentially. So this is the first one, the second one, and the third one. You don't actually need to have one compensate for, the other, for any of the others. And so at each level of the tree, there's a possibility that you make a decision. You may not, but, but there's always the possibility that you make a decision after each question, so here and here. And uh, another thing is there's no probabilities estimated in the end. It's just you go directly to the decision, put them to the emergency or not. So it has many features that really make it look very different from the standard decision theory. I, I hope you can actually see that they're really two different uh, worlds. So what I did together with two other colleagues is we ran a relatively large simulation where we tested these two models on a, an array of medical problems like the one I just explained to you with ischemic heart disease. So we had 11 of them. And here are the results. So let me explain a little bit about the method because you're going to see that again. So <coughs> first on the, uh, well, first let me say that we have four models. And basically the blue models, the blue bars, they're more standard models. One of them, this light blue, is exactly the logistic regression. And that's something else developed in artificial intelligence called classification and regression trees developed by Bryman. And the green things are actually two different varieties of the fast and frugal tree. They're different because they use different rules for deciding which feature goes first and second and where you put the exit to the left or to the right and so on. Um, but anyway, complex, simple. That's my caricature of the situation. So here on the y-axis, you have accuracy of these models averaged across these 11 problems. And uh, what changes in these four different sets of bars is the amount of data you had in order to calibrate your models. So what we did in every case was that, um, for, example, in this case, for example, in this case, we used 90% of the data to calibrate the models and then had the models predict the remaining 10% of the data with the calibrated parameters. So here we used all of the data to calibrate the parameters and we just measured performance. Here 90%, here 50%, and here 50%. So as you move along this um, axis, the problem becomes more uh, harder. Or at least you could say you have uh, less information. <coughs> so you can see the trend. You can see the numbers. Everybody's <laughs> focusing somewhere differently. But when you have a lot of data, basically, the blue bars are much higher. But this starts changing. And in the end, almost everybody's the same. In fact, you have a slight advantage for uh, one of the fast and frugal trees. And the advantage is, sma is small when you think about that in terms of numbers, but it's actually huge if you think how many people actually could be in that position every day. How many people really go to the hospital and it has to be decided whether they should be put in the emergency care or in a regular nursing bed. So even this 2% here could be very important. Uh, another lesson from here is that we're starting to get an appreciation that of how it works. Uh, as some more technical people here uh, probably know, there's this general theorem that's called no freelance theorems. There's typically no method that's always better than all other methods. All methods have the regions of superior performance. And here, these regions are delineated a little bit by the amount of information that's available. If you have a lot of information available, it's better to go with the standard models. But if you have less information available, it may be better to go with the simpler models. So there are conditions under which one obtains or the other. Um, let me present a couple more examples. So anybody knows what these people are doing? Similar, yeah, something like that. 
So these people are in, are in Vietnam and they just excavated and are transporting what is known as UXO, unexploded ordnance. So it could be a bomb, it could be bullets, it could be something that if, you, if you're unlucky enough to, to walk around it, it may exploit and injure or kill you. So this is a very real problem. Um, for example, between 2002 and 2006 in Afghanistan, uh, about 2,500 people were injured because they stepped into unexploded ordnance. Uh, 500 of those were killed, and more than, this, more than half of these 2,500 were children. Children are especially vulnerable because uh, they often just go and play without being uh, proctored, and then this can happen. Um, <coughs> it's a difficult problem to know as, a, as an engineer uh, when to decide to dig in and take out a piece of metal that emits an electromagnetic signal and when not to. Because not everything that emits a signal is actually dangerous, as you can see here. These things are, but this isn't. So it, part of it, after you've done all the physics and you created the features that are part of your signal, then this becomes a decision problem again about how to separate the UXOs, the unexploded ordnance, from what is called clutter, which is the non-UXOs. Um, so we, it's not very easy to get this data because usually the military of every country is working with it for its own purposes. Uh, but um, because we work with some researchers from the United States, we had access to one uh, artificially constructed field that, uh, uh, that contains both UXO and clutter. So the army went to Camp Simpert, Alabama, and planted these metallic objects. And uh, some of them are really dangerous, and some of them are not. Now, uh, the, the, any army probably would not even consider any method that uh, has the possibility of a, of, a false, of, a, of a miss, meaning that something is a UXO, and the decision model says that it's a clutter. This mistake is not uh, tolerated. What could be tolerated is the opposite mistake, that something is clutter and you say it's UXO. It's just more expensive, but it's not going to be fatal. So this is the criterion according to which we compared some models in this slide. So the number of clutter wrongly identified as UXOs. So this is the data. So it's a similar story with um, <coughs> the one you saw before. What was on the x-axis before is here now. We simply vary the calibration uh, set. So here the calibration set is 108. Here is 66, the remaining. So we test on 150. And here is 194. So again, as you move that way, the problem becomes harder for two reasons. You have to, you're tested on more objects, and you also have less objects on which to calibrate your model. Uh, this is again a fast and frugal tree. This is the classification and regression trees you saw before. And this is something that's called support vector machines, which is, in, in a sense, the state of the art method for these classification problems. Uh, you can see the stories actually, again, similar to before. Here, there is a, a very clear advantage of the fast and frugal tree eventually over CART, and still it does as well as the SVMs. So. Let me wrap up the, my review of results with uh, a more general problem from, for example, it could be from finance. So, of course, if, that if the question was exactly phrased like this, does Apple or Samsung have a stock value today, you could look it up. The point is, typically, you're trying to know the answer to that uh, in the future. So you're trying to know if Apple or Samsung will have a, a higher stock value uh, five years from now or something like this. So. Uh, I want to say here is something I, I, I will need later that most of the standard decision models often actually they're linear. So in this case, again, remember that their game is to try to use features, to combine features, so as to estimate the worth of an option. Here the worth of an option is its stock value. Um, what uh, differentiates these different models, regression, something that's called naive Bayes and tallying, is the weights that they use. So in regression, they're simply obtained by uh, minimizing the sum of squared errors. In naive base, it can be shown that they have a specific one. They're the log odds of some kind of correlation between its feature and the criterion. 
and in tiling they're simply all set to one. It's a simpler method. Uh, on the other hand, the analog to fast and frugal tree is something that again capitalizes on people's psychological preference for looking features up uh, one by one sequentially. And here it's called take the best. So what you would do, you would first compare the two options on one feature. If the two options have the same value on the feature, you will go to the next one, and so on until eventually it finds one feature that allows making a decision. And then the decision is based on only one feature. So basically this is equivalent, this is, this is very, very close to what the honeybee was doing in the sense that the, the um, options are in a sense evaluated, but they're evaluated based on only one feature. The first discriminating feature in the order you have uh, put them. Um, okay, and uh, this looks a little strange here. It's usually not, the lines are usually not thick, that thick with the exception of this line. So let me again, um, it's a very similar graph with the one with the medical problem. So here again, we vary the amount of information we have and it increases that way. And here is the predictive accuracy. Uh, <coughs> these three models are the linear models I showed you before, regression, naive Bayesian network, and tallying. And this is the take the best. So here actually there's a situation that you see uh, a quite large uh, difference across 20 judgment problems. Um, although when you have 50% of the data, you can see that actually regression catches up and they're almost identical. So recently there was, a, if you're interested in this research and you want to get to know the real details and you want to be really critical about it and find what's wrong about it and what I didn't tell you and all that, you can read this reader that was just published. It has a collection of about 40 papers that have been produced in the last 15, 20 years on this kind of problems. It has more theory. It spells out the models mathematically. Uh, and it also has many interesting applications, as for example, criminal profiling, uh, green electricity defaults, and so on. So uh, let me quickly uh, attempt to, pr to provide you a, a review of, the, of what we know about why this obtains. This is a little more the scientific part. We're not only happy knowing uh, with which one, which model we should pick under which condition, but also understanding the reasons why. So this tends to be more of an analytical enterprise, and it's actually very incomplete, as you will see. Uh, I'm not going to go into any maths, but I'm going to give you my own uh, synthesis of the results and a few qualitative explanations. So this is uh, <coughs> a first uh, stylized fact. Overall, there's not a huge difference, actually. Uh, I, th I hope you kind of remember that from the examples I saw you in Wimbledon. They're all about the same. They're also happening with the medical problems at some uh, training set sizes and so on. Uh, of course, always with the qualification, I'm trying to have it both ways here, that sometimes even a one percentage point difference is actually very important in practice. But in terms of numbers, there are overall not very large differences. Um, if rules of thumb have um, an advantage, this is actually in predicting. So in using little information to predict a lot of cases rather than using a lot or all of the information to just fit what you have. Uh, and in the end, if you want to <laughs> be very, uh, very uh, correct and conciliatory, actually the truth is that each model has its region of superior performance. So. Again, in very broad strokes, so that you just know that there are some answers. Here are some of these answers. So, so for this, it's, uh, the reason lies in this, uh, in this graphic I, I insisted on showing you where I claimed that many of the standard decision models are in fact linear. So this is actually also the case in the end about uh, some of the models of rules of thumb. So it could, for example, also be shown that take the best can be viewed as a linear model. So in the end, many of the models that are studied, they're just all linear with only, the only difference being in the weights of the different features. And it is, it is that's again a caricature, but it, it does hold in many situations that linear models actually over a range of tasks, they have relatively flat performance. Uh, what about the prediction? So, some, 
some models, the standard decision models like regression and classification, regression trees, and support vector machines, they need relatively large samples to estimate the parameters. But the rules of thumb don't need so much data. That's a way of understanding why um, the rules of thumb can be superior in prediction. Another reason is, is more technical. It has to do with the so-called bias variance dilemma. So there's a conjecture that the rules of thumb actually have less variance in their predictions. And that somehow, in the end, has the effect that they tend to be more accurate. But it's a little more technical story. And finally, each model can outperform the other. We have some conditions like that, which have the very non-intuitive <laughs> name of non-compensatoriness and compensatoriness. Briefly, compensatoriness is basically a quantitative <coughs> explication of saying that one feature is much more informative than all the others. So, uh, excuse me, this is non-compensatoriness. So this means basically that you can uh, forget all of the other features and just use one feature for predicting is much more informative. And also the opposite label exists, compensatoriness. And in this case, you may do better with a standard decision model. So I've summoned a lot of these results and the reasons for why they exist in the recent paper. So, good. so <coughs> let me uh, remind you what I said. So I started by complaining about a Stroman version of standard decision theory. But nevertheless, I think it has the core ideas intact. And this is that standard decision theory offers complex solutions to, com uh, to complex problems. And for me, the complexity lies in asking from the decision maker and all the other stakeholders to simply estimate too much. And that's maybe a graphic that can help you remember what too much means. You have to estimate outcomes. You have to estimate probabilities. And you have to estimate this function so you can map outcomes and probabilities to their subjective values to the decision maker. It, it, it is too much. So this is an alternative that's that's a, a patchwork. It's a developed bottom up. It's really like the best practices approach in systems engineering. So through talking to <laughs> psychologists, behavioral ecologists, and all sorts of people, we started understanding that there are some simple rules of thumb that under some conditions can do well. And uh, this is the state of this theory. It's still uh, kind of a patchwork. There is a lot we don't know. For example, we know very little, not we know very little, biologists know a lot about the social heuristics that these animals use, but those haven't exactly been uh, put in a mathematical form that we would like so that we could also test them. Uh, perhaps another criticism of this approach is, especially if I'm talking to an audience like you, that even though we made a big effort of considering problems that are kind of unstructured, you could still say, they're much more structured than the classical decision problems in systems. And this is, this is definitely true. So, and here's my, my, my summary. So, um, of course, this is, this is a very broad stroke. It's a little bit of a journalistic summary. But uh, maybe for a mixed audience, it's, it's appropriate. Um, we also collaborate, we started to collaborate in, in a project with the Bank of England. And recently, if you, if you noticed in the Jackson Hole Conference, uh, Andy Heldane had exactly a paper. He gave a paper where he exactly said we need simpler financial regulation. So this is exactly the, the new thing in this talk. If you think about it, most of the standard uh, approach advocates complex solutions to complex problems. And uh, simply, there could be a reason to uh, consider the alternative. Uh, the, the truth is that no model is always better. Sometimes one outperforms the other. And because of that fact, in the end, there's a lot of conceptual thinking that needs to be done uh, on how exactly to uh, combine the two. And uh, something I recently started thinking about and may help some people here to, uh, to keep the, the main message of this talk in their minds is that it's really the, the key words here is that you're trying to combine something overarching, the overarching concept of Bayesian utility maximization with this patchwork of rules of thumb. Or to put it in another way, I think a challenge and where decision theorists and practitioners need to 
so ingenuity and wisdom and so on, is really to think how to uh, combine the standard decision theory, the hedgehog, with the fox, which is the rules of thumb. So thank you very much for listening.